from where you are. The her, yeah, it's going to be Maria. Everybody, what happens when I make my presentation? Do we switch seats or do no, turn? No. 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 You're going to be right next to me. Uhuru, <laughs> Kunde, Uhuru, Kunde. Right on time, as always. Thank you, Kunde. Your fingers work fast. Uhuru, Casey. <laughs> Uhuru, comrade. All right. Oh, right on. Uhuru Solidarity in Boston having a viewing party with six people. Uhuru comrades. Kunde says Uhuru chairman. <coughs> right on. Uhuru Solidarity Movement in Boston. Can we get a roll call? I know it's Hallie, Casey. Uhuru Dia! <laughs> Uhuru, as you can see, we have Chairman of the African People's Socialist Party, Chairman Amalia Ashtela, here joining us today. And we'll be starting shortly. Want to wheel the audience? Uhuru Star! All the way in St. Louis. <laughs> Uhuru, comrades, all this love. Jesus. Uhuru, Jenny. Uhuru, Jenny. Mm. Do those hearts and things evoke an emotional response? Yes. They do, huh? No, it's not political. It's very, no, it's not, I'm not, I'm just trying to get accustomed to this relationship we have with. <laughs> yes, we're getting a lot of love. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah. So they evoke a response when you see that and say, wow, mm -hmm. love, love, love. It's right. a lot of love. You can, okay. um, they'll do, if they like it, they'll do a thumb, hearts for love. You can do laughing emojis, do all kinds of stuff. Mm. Mm -hmm. All kinds of stuff. Okay, okay. Dokie. Yeah. Well, you'll know if you said something funny. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you should get a lot of them. So that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not the comedian. Uhuru. And I'm going to give it about one more minute, then we're going to go ahead and start. We've got about 16 so far, including those in Boston. And we're expecting a whole host of people. I know it's a little bit early. Not really. It's 7 p.m. starting time. So giving everybody an opportunity to come on and join us. For this live stream, and um, I really want to appreciate the presence of Chairman Molly Ishtela and everybody for joining on to this live. And it says we have about 20 people, so let's see y'all commenting. Um, oh, oh, night. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed Naya Bingi, Uhuru, and uh, Zenzale, Uhuru consignment. Happy belated birthday! Oh, thank you. And Uhuru, the chairman, and I have Penny Hess, Uhuru, Penny. So, oh, okay. Some rapid joins. I'm sorry if I miss anybody, if I don't say Uhuru. Again, just want to say a big Uhuru shout out to all of those in um, Boston. Uhuru, in Boston. Oh, um, Uhuru, Renee. Uhuru, Nick. Uhuru. <laughs> Uhuru. All right, right on. So. Revisai, Uhuru Revisai, Houston in the house, Uhuru Mira, Mira in the house. All right, so I'm sorry if I don't get everybody. Alikia, Ghost, 
Guru. Oh, who getting angry? Who got an anger emoji? I hope that was a um mistake. Whoever mad. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and begin. I um, just really wanna appreciate everybody who is on right now. Um, really appreciate you guys for coming on. This is the first first installment of our web uh, monthly web series produced by the Just for the Three John Black Girls Committee. And each month we will be presenting a different topic um, with different keynote speakers, summing up the relationship of the Three John Black Girls campaign to the struggle for total liberation of African people. Because as we know, it's just not you know a campaign in a vacuum, but it's a part of the strategy to overturn this whole colonial relationship that we have to the system because you know this whole case exists as a result of you know the colonial conditions imposed upon African people. So um, this web series will also be functioning as an ongoing fundraiser for the 3DBG legal fees because we are currently engaged in trying to raise $18,000 to file a wrongful death suit against the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department. So make sure you catch us every month trying to keep up with all of the, you know, the different additions to the web series that we're going to have. Again, I want to say that I am joined with me um, of the African People Socialist Party Chairman Amalia Chatella. A thorough salute, comrade, to you. And if you are, um, if you don't know about the significance of today, today is October 24th, 2017, which is the official 21st anniversary of the murder of 18-year-old Tyron Lewis. And um, on October 24th, 1996, Tyron Lewis was shot down by um, James Knight and Sandra Minor, who were two St. Petersburg police um, cops in St. Petersburg who shot Tyron Lewis, 18 years old. And, you know, the death of Tyron Lewis sparked this fierce, fierce resistance, this rebellion in St. Petersburg, Florida. And, you know, the African community fearlessly took to the streets and pushed back the police who attacked the Uhuru house with every ounce of tear gas they had and, and with, in an attempt to assassinate leaders of the movement, including the chairman, and crush the revolutionary um, organization, to crush the movement, to, you know, complete the counterinsurgency, basically. Um, that's what happened in 1996, but this community fought back, pushed those, back, pushed those cops back, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later. In fact, that's why Chairman is with us um, today to, you know, talk about that amazing, extraordinary history. Just want to um, accrue a salute to Kobina, Liu, David, Jake Scott, Chrissy, Uhuru comrades, thank you all for joining. And so I'm going to start us off and I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, who I'm very excited for, Chairman Amalia Shakella, um, who is going to bring us back to 1996 and lay out the timeline of struggle strategies and, and the demands of that period. So if anybody isn't familiar with the Justice for the Three John Black Girls campaign, it is a campaign that started after the March 31st, 2016 murders of Dominique Battle, Lanaya Miller, and Ashanti Butler. And they were chased and corralled by the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department. And um, the chase began with this Deputy Howard Skaggs, who was actually previously involved in another murder of an African teenager in 2002 um, in a very eerie, eerily similar case. Um, he chased his girls, corralled them, into a pond and um, at the end result, as the car was 15 feet away from shore, submer submerging underwater, 17 sheriff's deputies stood around and engaged in this callous conversation. Um, and all these sheriff's deputies are trained as first responders, which means that they are equipped to do a water rescue if some, in the event that something like this happens. So 17 sheriff's deputies who have their seats in their cars at active flotation devices, who have, you know, those little materials that um, knock in windows, even a helicopter was there on the scene that night. And none of that equipment was utilized as they watched for six minutes, um, these girls screaming for their lives. And then after that, coming out of that, not even, you know, a solid 24 hours after they killed those girls, they began waging a slander campaign before they even you know, met with, um, you know, the mothers of these three girls, including Kunde Mwambita, the mother of Dominic Battle. Before even meeting with these girls, they started waging a slander campaign, putting out these so-called criminal histories of these girls to justify the murders 
of these girls to villainize the victims and paint these pigs, these murderous pigs as heroes. And then they approached Kunde in this real vicious manner. You know, she's at work and they come to her in the middle of the day and they're harassing her about her daughter and her whereabouts and things like that before they even tell her, you know, this horrific news. And, you know, this is what, this happened last year in 2016. And so this web conference is titled, you know, 21 years later, the battle continues. And that's because we are involved in a serious struggle to overturn these conditions that are inflicted upon the African community because the conditions haven't changed for the African community. In fact, they've worsened over the course of time. And I mean, we see that with the recent murder of these three girls, we see that when, um, when they murdered Markel McCullough, who was 17 years old, we saw it when they uh, murdered uh, Jarrell Walker and Javon Dawson, both 17 years old. Um, when they, you know, murdered, they murdered Hydra Lacey and they bulldozed his whole, whole entire home and to discard all the evidence um, that the police were at fault. We saw it um, even in this year when they murdered three teenage boys, Desiree Thomas, Jimmy Goshi, and Keontae Brown, the youngest one being 14 years old in another event where they illegally chased and pursued these children and led them into a fiery crash. And then after that, you know, sl immediately slandering them, um, you know, painting them in this horrific way to where people would lose sight in the humanity of African children. And this is what they are, you know, constantly involved in. They murdered Alton Wichard, who was a 37 year old African father, um, you know, gunned him down right in front of his home. Um, right in his back. And this is the kind of, you know, the police terror, the police occupation that exists within the African community 21 years later, and that it's intensified um, over this course of time. And we recently um, ended these campaigns for office. Um, I myself ran for District 6 City Council, and the Rural Solidarity Movement Chair, Jesse Neville, ran for mayor. And this was a question you know, the question of the murder of these three girls, you couldn't leave a debate, you couldn't leave any event without knowing the names of these girls, without knowing this case. And because it was, this case was a testament to the conditions that we were working to overturn and we created this platform. Um, Chairman Amalia Chatella created this brilliant platform, Unity Through Reparations, which was, um, you know, had its basis in the National Black Political Agenda for Self-Determination from the Black is Back Coalition. And, you know, in this platform, you know, we're speaking to reparations to African people and genuine economic development. We're talking about black community control of the police and an end to gentrification. And, you know, all of these were an agenda that spoke, and it was an agenda for the African working class. Um, and this is why the Three Drowned Black Girls was so critical in this entire electoral campaign, um, because to, you know, to even speak to this question, you have to look at the conditions that are imposed upon African community, on the African community on a day-to-day -day basis. And I was, you know, talking about how the police occupation of the African community has only intensified since they murdered Tyron Lewis. And when you look at 21 years ago, you look at the African community then, and you look at the African community a week ago now, it doesn't even look the same. And because the African community here is being forcibly kicked out of our community through this hostile process of gentrification. And it doesn't just look like African people being kicked out of their homes, um, you know, because they can't afford their rent or anything like that. I mean, it looks like no affordable housing um, being available to begin with. It looks like these housing programs that require you to jump through all these hoops and bounds and not able to have, you know, an African man in the household, or you have to move out of your community to be even able to um, get any type of assistance, living assistance. And but it also looks like police occupation in your community. And, you know, they're there to, you know, protect those who are coming into your community, who are taking your community, the land grabbers, the gentrifiers, you know, the, you know, the high rise builders, all of those people who are coming in and preying upon the African community. That's who the police are protecting. And meanwhile, facilitating the process of kicking African people out of our community in a vicious, hostile way, which includes murder of African people. And, um, during this campaign, I mean, we just really tackled this question of gentrification and, you know, black, and then we talked about black community control of schools, which was another, um, 
because we understand that school is another institution that oppresses African children. And we went, um, you know, we even last year after the murder of these three girls, one, I mean, none of the schools on which these girls even attended had, you know, any kind of memor memorial for these girls at all. And you go to any other high school where, you know, the white football guy, you know, job dies, you know, the whole school goes on this memorial and they do moments of silence and things like that. And nobody said anything about these three girls. It was only the Uhuru movement that ever said anything. And then you look at just the police occupation of every school in the African community and, you know, police armed to the teeth with guns, tasers, batons, pepper spray. And even an event last year where African girls were approached for wearing head wraps by police officers, you know, with their hands on their guns, telling these girls that they have to take off their head wraps or they'll report them and all these different kinds of things. And also just brutalizing African children on school campuses and things of that nature. Um, and that's why we just raised these very critical demands um, during this campaign. And, you know, it was a part of the continuation of, you know, the struggle that was waged in 1996. Um, but, you know, we're going to talk about that and go through the history of how historic that was and how this community really rose up against that. And, um, but, yeah, the battle does continue and, you know, it continues in this campaign for justice for these three girls um, because it's, again, not just a campaign in a vacuum um, who are, is fighting solely for this case because this is an isolated case. And, you know, when murders of Af when they murdered Tyrone Lewis, it wasn't an isolated case. When they murdered African, when they murdered Mike Brown and, you know, Ferguson, and they murdered Sandra Bland and Freddie Gray, it wasn't isolated cases. It was all a part of the colonial contradiction. It was all a part of, you know, the colonial system that we find our, that we are living under that requires, you know, the oppression and the murder of African people by, um, the, by the state, by the police that function that way. So, um, um, I just really want to, you know, make that clear and, and just re really say that we have a lot of work to do um, because 21 years later, we have to, you know, really win the people to understanding the significance of what happened in 1996 and, you know, build that same resistance, organized resistance to overturn, you know, this colonial relationship um, that we have. And, you know, from 21 years ago, you know, they're not being an African community. African people live, you know, what are we, 70% um, below the poverty line. I was estimated a few years back, who knows what that's like now. Um, but, you know, also something that, you know, is really significant that 21 years ago we didn't have. You know, the Uhuru movement has always played such a, I mean, the Uhuru movement did play a critical role in what happened in 1996 and the fact that it was organized resistance. And 21 years later, um, you know, after all these struggles have been waged, your crew movement has won so much. And not only has this movement increased in its membership all around the world, um, not only has this campaign alone, you know, really just changed the narrative and defended African children and, you know, is really always, you know, holding up the African working class, holding up mothers like Kunde Mwambita, but we also engage in building so many different institutions and creating the capacity for the African community to be, uh, you know, self-determined and, you know, economically um, self-reliant and independent. We're building independence in the African community. And I mean, since 21 years ago, we have, you know, the Tyrone Lewis Community Gym and we have the Uhuru Jiko Kitchen. And we also now have Black 96.3 FM radio station to add to the different institutions that the Uhuru movement have like, has like a Faba Hall and um, the Burning Spear newspaper. And also, I mean, we've had the Institute, um, the Uhuru House in Oakland, California, the furniture store in Oakland, California. We've also had, um, you know, the Philadelphia furniture store. We have Uhuru Foods and Pies, an amazing economic institution um, that exists here in St. Petersburg, Florida and in Oakland, California. And now we are breaking ground um, which is tremendous work by this movement and by Deputy Chair Ona Zanea Shatella, um, who leads the economic development work of the African Socialist Party, who um, has forged herself into, you know, St. Louis and have learned, has learned all these skills to now acquire an Uhuru house in St. Louis. 
We have a Hulu Jico Kitchen and a Hulu Bakery and Cafe coming to St. Louis. And we have, you know, our own lot so we can create night markets in St. Louis and um, also, you know, just acquire different properties. And we took these properties that belong to, you know, the city that belongs to the state and we took them out of the hands of soon to be gentrifiers and turned it over back to the African community. And so 21 years later, the conditions, um, you know, of African people have worsened by, you know, the system. But the Uhuru movement is forging the way and showing the way forward and winning every step of the way. So um, I really, really, really just appreciate the Uhuru movement for its profound leadership, for its profound strategies. And oh, also want to say that a part of that economic development work that is just, you know, sweeping, you know, St. Louis by storm and even our different institutions everywhere we are, you know, Kunde Mombita, um, after this horrific incident happened, Kunde you know, one of the, you know, most bravest and shining examples of, you know, an African working class woman and, you know, what it looks like to resist this kind of um, incident. She joined this movement um, and she made sure that, you know, I'm going to be a part of this movement. And now she is a leader in the economic development work and she works in the office of deputy chair and she holds it down right here in St. Petersburg, Florida. So um, a huru salute to Kunde. I want to salute to um, the entire Hulu movement, and um, I want to go ahead and um, rewind back the time. And because before there were Baltimore uprisings or the Ferguson rebellions, there was the Battle of St. Petersburg, and it was a period of time lasting. You know, well, it didn't last from October 24th to November 13th. It was actually, you know, it was a very extensive period of time. And um, even after, you know, that from October 24th to November 13th. Um, it informed the political environment of this city and even various places around this country. And it's a struggle that continues to resonate in the hearts of the African working class community 21 years later. And in fact, um, the sister of Tyrone Lewis, Deanne Lewis, put out this post on Facebook, you know, saluting and saying long live Tyrone Lewis and all of these people from the city of St. Pete just started flooding in with all of these comments, you know, rest in peace, Tyrone Lewis, and you are with us, you know, and long live. And so it still sits, you know, with the African community. And um, again, with us today to lay out this timeline and the Uhuru movement's clear leadership in this process and the demands raised during that period, um, it is my profound honor to turn this over to Chairman Amalia Shatella. If we will come cool. I'd like to thank uh, Comrade Akile uh, for the introduction, and I would like to thank the uh, Justice Committee for the Three Crown Black Girls uh, for doing this webinar. And um, I want to say that it is really important for us to understand uh, what happened some 20 years, 21 years ago, with the brutal murder of Tyrone Lewis and uh, the subsequent uh, rebellion uh, then and the rebellion that uh, was related to the attack on this Uhura house in St. Petersburg uh, by the local police and various other police organizations from neighboring counties and from the state itself. I am sorely disappointed that this anniversary is not being done um, more effectively. I appreciate this discussion that we're having now, but I think that uh, that whole struggle, uh, the Battle of St. Petersburg, and what has come uh, in its wake, uh, it offers so many uh, lessons that have, that have to be learned by our own movement, uh, by African people in this city, uh, and by Africans throughout this country. And there, are, there were so many players involved in this process, um, diverse players uh, across class lines, um, across ideological and political lines, various place, players who uh, were put in motion uh, with the assassination of Tyrone Lewis and then subsequently the attack by uh, the police of the state uh, uh, on the Uhuru House uh, and its leaders. I think uh, what really needs to be understood is the role of the African People's Socialist Party as a revolutionary party. The International People's Democratic, Democratic Uhuru Movement uh, is a mass organization of the African People's Socialist Party. And it played uh, also a primary role in what had 
what occurred on October 24th uh, and then later on November 13th. On October 24th, just uh, uh, about three blocks away from the Uhuru House in a community where we have been, had been working for 30 years uh, consistently, um, selling a newspaper, passing out uh, flyers, uh, uh, propaganda inside the communities, um, uh, doing events, programs, uh, regular uh, meetings every Sunday, and in many instances, with only a few people uh, present at our meetings and things like that. Uh, but the fact that we worked consistently all that time obviously had a really powerful impact on the community. And we had organizers that were always in the street. It wasn't uh, that we didn't have uh, a situation where somebody uh, has been killed and everybody uh, is excited and everybody's now talking about black this, black that. But it was a time after uh, our revolution had suffered a major defeat in the 1960s and had not yet recovered from it uh, when um, uh, so many uh, Africans had been pushed out of political life. And when I say political life, I'm not talking about this election stuff. I'm talking about actually being involved in trying to change our circumstances on the ground. The Black Panther Party destroyed. Uh, various other revolutionary organizations destroyed, uh, effectively destroyed, and uh, uh, the members uh, dispersed, arrested, uh, things like that. That was the situation that we found ourselves in. But the African People's Socialist Party has been on the ground uh, since 1960, since 1972, and the Uhuru movement has been on the ground in the city of St. Petersburg since at least 1966, uh, because one of the groups that came into uh, the African People's Socialist Party that helped to create the African People's Socialist Party was JOMO. And then before JOMO, there was a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, and I participated in both those organizations. And these were precursors to the African People's Socialist Party, but they were the, a part of what we refer to as the Uhuru Movement. So when Tyron Lewis was gunned down in broad daylight, uh, as I said, just three blocks away from the Uhuru House, we had organizers on the street because the people uh, came straight to the Uhuru House, the people who never had come to meetings, many of them uh, people who uh, we had sold Burning Spears, passed out literature all these years. Uh, when, when this young brother was murdered in broad daylight, the people came to the Uhuru House. And so we were on the scene uh, immediately. And because the African People's Socialist Party uh, was the leader of the entire Uhuru movement, we were able to address the question uh, in various different ways. And uh, first of all, you should know that immediately with this assassination police there, that uh, there were uh, people who were uh, given political education, standing on top cars, educating the masses of people, what had just happened, what it meant uh, for this murder of this young brother. And uh, shortly after that, uh, we saw the engagement of hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat with the police right there on the scene. And that uh, later developed into an actual armed confrontation, Molotov cocktails, uh, uh, setting police cars or fire. Uh, it was, it was a, a rebellion that had consciousness, something that had never been seen before, or if it had, it had been a very long time since anything like this had been seen before. It had consciousness, and it had revolutionary organizers on the ground who were able to translate this, what was occurring uh, to masses of people who were engaging directly with the state. And while our party uh, would not have called on an insurrection or rebellion under the, those, under most circumstances, uh, because the fact is that when you talk about rising up, then you have to be talking about some conclusions. You have to be talking about defeating a, an oppressive a co colonial uh, power, and then you have to be talking about how that contributes to taking power. A movement uh, did not uh, have that kind of strength anywhere in the country, but despite the fact that we never would have called for that, it is the responsibility of actual revolutionaries uh, to be with the people all the time. And so when the people uh, rise up, then it is absolutely necessary for revolutionaries to be on the ground with the people. And we cannot be bystanders. And so uh, while a lot of things happen, uh, uh, two police precincts were torched, were burned uh, to the ground. 
uh, liquor store was burned to the ground. Uh, one uh, 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 front furniture store that had built itself uh, off flimsy uh, furniture, you know, the joint where after you, by the time you made your last payment, the furniture falls apart and you have to start over again. It was burned to the ground. Uh, uh, and it was just an amazing uh, kind of uprising that uh, shook uh, the ruling class here in a very serious way. And then uh, this white man, uh, cop, uh, uh, Mac Knight, James Knight, uh, had, uh, it was reported that he had killed Tyrone Lewis. He had shot through the window. And uh, he had shot uh, with his partner, uh, uh, the uh, white woman cop, Sandra Minor had uh, had broken the glass in the and with her with her nightstick in the back of uh, of the, one of the rear windows uh, and set up uh, the process that led to that contributed to the killing. And then what happened was per usual, and this was in broad daylight and there were people all around. And so they uh, they con- con- uh, create this story. Uh, that somehow Knight was standing in front of the car. This is the cop Knight, and that uh, uh, after they had chased him down, and then they, they told the story that it was a stolen car, and that they found crack cocaine in the car after they stopped it. And then, according to them, that uh, Lewis, uh, while he was parking, was told to get out of the car. Instead, he rams a uh, Knight uh, uh, in the legs with his car, and this is the th- this is the thing that forced the Knight. Uh, to shoot after he was hit uh, so violently that he was thrust upon the hood of the car. This is the story that they told. And uh, per usual, the African petty bourgeoisie, that the spineless uh, African middle class that collaborators most, in most instances uh, bought that story. But it didn't matter because the masses of people are rising up now and have setting the terms for any narrative, any discussion that's going to happen now has to happen around the fact that masses of African people are rising up and they're fighting in the streets with the police. And so uh, shortly afterwards, uh, uh, someone comes to the Uhura house and said, look, right down the street. In fact, uh, a block away, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, is having a press conference. And this was a man named Sabel Brown, who was supposed to be the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference at the time. And they're having a press conference right down the street. And so uh, I went down to where the press conference was occurring. And when I got there, uh, they asked me to come into this back room with them. And what they had determined was that they were having a press conference and they wanted to get together and say, this is what we want to demand. We're demanding economic inclusion. So they, 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 they don't, the, meet, the press conference is the actual meeting that they have with the press conference. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, uh, we will agree with the demand for economic inclusion, but uh, you have to agree uh, that uh, uh, the reparations to the family of Tyrone Lewis freed all the people who've been arrested during the rebellion, uh, jail the killer cops, uh, and hands off the Uhuru movement because they had already declared that the Uhuru movement had incited the entire rebellion or had led the rebellion and things like that. And uh, so they agreed. And they agreed because they had to agree. Because what the middle class, the petty bourgeoisie does in every city throughout this country, and in fact, in every country that's led by new coin puppets, when the masses rise up, they go to boss, they go to white boss, they go to the ruling class and say, look, give us these monies, this monies for my little programs and we can keep the masses from rising up. But the problem they had is they couldn't promise that they could keep the masses from rising up because the ruling class had already said it was the Uhuru movement that was responsible for the rebellion in the first place. And uh, as a consequence of that, they came into this relationship with us. They created what was called uh, some kind of uh, uh, a coalition of Afro-American leaders or something to that effect, and, and, uh, which was fine uh, because we needed that because we had become the target of the state. They were definitely coming at us, and so... This coalition was comprised of, uh, of uh, preachers and other sectors of the African petty bourgeoisie and the rural movement and masses and masses of African working class uh, people and especially young people. And that was important for us because we needed to advance 
a uh, whole different narrative from what was coming out. And so uh, we created the coalition and I sort of got uh, uh, I'm responsible for uh, the chair for the political action committee, which meant that uh, I actually led all the political work that the coalition was doing. That is to say the African People's Socialist Party did. And uh, when we would have meetings, conferences, et cetera, even when we were picking leaders, uh, uh, I made it clear to our party, our movement, and people who followed us that we did not want to be the leader of the coalition. We just wanted to lead the political action committee. Let Reverend so-and-so be the leader. Let this person be the leader. It wouldn't have served us to have been the leader of this thing up front because uh, uh, we were the leaders of the community, uh, but what had to happen is we had to give the rulers of this, of this city a, uh, a, a, a responsibility if they wanted to come at the Uhuru movement, they had to come through uh, the preachers and come through the middle class people, et cetera, et cetera, to get to us. And that was the dilemma that we uh, decided that we would create for them on the one hand. On the other hand, we created a situation where the African petty bourgeoisie, the middle class, the neo colonial uh, puppets could be less supine uh, because now they didn't have, have to. Uh, and claim responsibility for anything that was going on because they could say, well, boss, it wasn't my idea. The coalition uh, came up with it and I just had to go along, something to that effect. So we gave them an out and created uh, a serious resistance. And part of what we did was demanded that uh, uh, as, as part of our strategy, opposition, a vocal opposition to the uh, traditional, historical, uh, and existing uh, public policy of police containment, because that's a public policy that consi consists of, that exists throughout this country where it comes to African people. The so-called crime problem, whether it's the, the, the three, the, the black children that are stealing all the cars and you got to have more cops and you got to have more rules and you got to have uh, uh, all of this. And so uh, a, a, a politician isn't a good politician unless it's calling for more cops and look, jailing people and building more prisons. So it's a public policy of police containment of the African community that was in existence then and it's in existence now. And because the African population in this country is a colonial population, it's colonized. And the only way that white power can control it is through police containment, military containment uh, that's disguised as some kind of uh, domestic or civic uh, or civil uh, uh, authority. It's a military containment uh, occupation of the African communities, and that's what they had. And to, to challenge that uh, was a very serious thing, and it was something that most people could unite with, and certainly even the African petty bourgeoisie, because the African petty bourgeoisie, when you talk about uh, economic development, they see dollar signs, and that means something for them. So yeah, economic development, but economic development meant more than dollar signs. In fact, we, we actually, uh, defined it uh, as a transparent process that would uh, uh, create, uh, uh, that would provide a, a massive infusion of capital into the African community that would, could be used uh, to shore up existing black businesses, create new black businesses and cooperatives and things like that. And it would be a transparent democratic process that doesn't go as it does typically to the Negro with the mayor's phone number in the back pocket and who can call up the mayor and get the payoff uh, for himself in order to uh, quell uh, the resistance of the mass of the people. So it was a powerful. We had marches down the streets uh, right in front of the Uhuru House calling for economic development. Here, African people marching, we want economic development for our communities. Uh, we had a situation that we forced the bankers and what have you to come to uh, a neighborhood uh, uh, center uh, and defend uh, themselves uh, from the, the reality that they refused to loan African people money, that Africans could not even get access to our own monies. Uh, and by that, what I mean is that every Sunday, uh, some the Negro preachers take all that money, every Monday, all that money that black people give them on Sundays, uh, uh, they go and take it and put it in the banks. And the black people, our, our African people, we spend money in the mall, we spend money, et cetera, and that money ends up in the bank and the bank would take that money and then they would loan it to people and make money off our money. But when it comes to Africans wanting to be able to open businesses of our own or to show up existing businesses, we couldn't get a loan from the bank. They always had a, 
a reason why we couldn't get a loan, our own money from the bank. And so we struggled against that and had a, a really powerful uh, resistance movement that had emerged and it made sense. And what was really important about it is because the rulers of this city like throughout the country uh, like to, uh, they like to uh, be able to say that the African uh, working class is inarticulate and that uh, uh, it, it doesn't have a vision of its own, it can't speak to its own affairs, and they found out that the African, African working class was extraordinarily articulate, they had their own program, and this is what we wanted, and that the people who they had put up in front of the cameras and said these are the leaders were not really the leaders, and so we had this powerful movement, and it, it shook them up in a very serious way. So after the killing, uh, they, they, the state, uh, going through the traditional uh, formality, uh, uh, taking the murder case to the grand jury. The grand jury, uh, any place, is, is a joke. The grand jury uh, is a secret uh, uh, hearing, uh, uh, supposedly a hearing, uh, where uh, nobody knows what's going on there, uh, and it used to be stated that a, a grand jury uh, would indict a ham sandwich. And that was, a st that was to say that whatever the prosecutor wanted from a grand jury, that's what they got. And in this case, uh, this man, uh, who was the uh, Pasco Pinellas County, uh, 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 it's not district attorney, he has some other kind of uh, name, but uh, uh, took the, the case, he said before the grand jury, and we predicted the grand jury was not going to uh, indict the murderers of Tyrone Lewis and called for a, a public meeting on the day that the indictment, uh, that the grand jury was supposed to uh, uh, release its findings. And that would have been uh, on a Wednesday, uh, on November 13th. And so uh, on November 13th, that Wednesday, uh, I was coming from a meeting with the, uh, with the uh, coalition and when i arrived uh, the police had just pulled over uh, uh eight, 21 cops had pulled over a car uh, of uh, a, a person who was a, a, a part of the uhura movement and they said to arrest him for having an expired license plate and uh 21 uh, members of uh, a swat team had pulled him over and when i arrived and and walked uh, to the scene uh, the police arrested the person who was doing security for me, and then they pepper sprayed me, and it was chaos. They had cops riding up and down uh, the street in front of the Hoodoo house. They had, uh, uh, they were with uh, sometimes four in a car with uh, shotguns and what have you sticking out of the windows, uh, and they were just riding up and down and clearly attempting to provoke something uh, in the community. And uh, as I mentioned, they pepper sprayed me, they pepper sprayed another uh, sister leader. Uh, in the face uh, with this, and and uh, hundreds of people are now standing on uh, watching the cops go up and down. And uh, I went into the Huda house. They blocked the the, the the streets and telling people that they can't come to the meeting. And people tried to go around them. They were pepper sprayed and things like that. So I went into the Huda house. And when I went in, because I, I got pepper spray all in my face, and I'm washing that out, I come uh, and I stand before the people who are in the Huda house, and as I'm preparing to speak to them, uh, someone comes in and says, the police say we have five minutes to get out of the building or they're gonna shoot tear gas into the building. And about 30 seconds after that, they began to shoot tear gas into the building. And, and then there were children and women and what happened in the building, people throwing up uh, and women screaming, where are my babies, uh, trying to locate their children, some of whom were, some of which were upstairs. Uh, and, uh, and it was on. And uh, when that happened, uh, the, the, the entire uh, environment, the entire the Uhura house was surrounded uh, by these gun-wielding thugs, uh, uh, occupation uh, military forces that call themselves police. They had the, uh, all the county cops here. They had the sheriff's department here. They had uh, the highway patrol. And then they had the National Guard on standby uh, at, the, uh, at the, uh, this dome. Uh, that they uh, created in our community's baseball team. And uh, they, made, they made it impossible for many people who, who were in our movement to get back into uh, the building. I was trapped in the building. Uh, Chimarenga was trapped in the building. Uh, some of the leaders of our party trapped in the building at this time. 
we couldn't get out. Every time somebody tries to leave, they would shoot tear gas uh, at the building. They were shooting tear gas uh, canisters, uh, and these canisters uh, would, uh, would, uh, were flammable. They would start fires. They set uh, the trees and behind the rural house uh, alight. They were, they were set afire, and the people in the community, young people come and they would snatch the burning branches out and try to drag them across the street, and the police would shoot the tear gas canister at them. They shot tear gas canister top the roof of the Hura house, trying to set it afire. They brought um, a light airplane, and then a helicopter came over. And uh, 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 by now, of course, uh, the, the, the situation is that, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of people couldn't get back in, so they trapped a lot of, the, lot of us in the building, and then they would not allow some of the members of our organization to get in the building, so they were outside with the masses of the people. And what happened on the outside uh, was very dramatic uh, because uh, the people fought them first with stones and whatever was available, and then they, they, they engaged them uh, with guns, and they began to shoot at the cops, and they shot a helicopter from the sky, uh, wounded the pilot who was in the helicopter. And, uh, and so they chased the police out of the community. That was an incredible struggle. It was an, a struggle that we saw every form of struggle uh, utilized in this, in this battle uh, with the state in this situation. So that happened on November 13th. On no, and and uh, we had to, many of us, we had, most of us had to leave the water house and had to find safe houses. Uh, and they were looking for us with helicopters and things like that. And so uh, on the next day, we back at the water house and we learned that, uh, uh, that the this, this city is sponsoring a march. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a unity march. And it was to start uh, not too far from the Uhuru House, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we had these uh, black and white unite and fight kind of unity. Unity is what they were, were chanting. And what we had decided was that mm -hmm. we, we uh, put on, on black uniforms and combat boots and, and berets and said, let them start and then uh, we're gonna come behind them. And uh, as they were marching down the street, we were double timing or jogging behind them. And, and what was amazing is as we were coming behind them, the Africans were coming out of the houses and doors and they were cheering as they saw us coming down behind these, these, these people who were chanting unity, unity, unity. And uh, we, were, we, were, we were being cheered, you know, hail as conquering heroes and what have you. And uh, they took this little marsh that they were having down to a place called Stroud Park, which uh, has an interesting history on a couple of levels, not the least of which being that it was named for a white man who was a really important uh, city leader uh, who, I think, in 1927 participated in the murder, the lynching of John Evans, uh, uh, along with the owner of the St. Pete Times at that time. Uh, but Stroud Park, you know, it has its own history. And so when we got to Stroud Park, it was mostly white people who were there. And what was amazing is when the mayor stood up to speak, the people started to boo the mayor. Mm -hmm. And then when they announced that I was coming to speak, everybody starts cheering. And so here I am on the platform, all these people are cheering. And of course they're cheering uh, uh, in part uh, because we, we uh, survived this brutal attack and that we were the people who were still resisting and, uh, leading this struggle. And so that sort of set the terms for uh, politically for what would be happening uh, in this city uh, thereafter. The city council uh, did a very serious criticism of the police department uh, in, the, in the following days uh, for being ill-prepared, for running out of tear gas. <laughs> they used all the tear gas in the city of St. Petersburg at our building. They used every bit of it on our building. And, the, and they were criticized for running out of tear gas. And uh, what happened uh, was that uh, in a way to, uh, to get ahead of this thing, they uh, actually uh, got rid of the existing police chief, a white man, and then got this African who had been in the police department for a long time, Goliath Davis, uh, and they made him the chief of police with the assumption that Goliath would come and just be another neo-colonial face. But we had seeded the ground too well politically in this city. Uh, and, and it would be impossible for them uh, to do uh, for Goliath, if he had, even if he had wanted to, to do what they wanted him to do. Uh, because uh, we had, uh, uh, so Goliath, when he he's gets there, 
he comes out and he says that we don't need uh, any more uh, police containment. We need economic development for the African community. And that meant that for a sector of the rulers and the city council that Goliath became a suspect himself. And he was before the city council on a regular basis uh, because of that. And then he announced that the Uhura House would, uh, that no one would be arrested in the Uhura House, that the Uhura House would be treated like an embassy uh, uh, and that nobody would be touched in the Uhura House. And this uh, created some huge contradictions as well. And they began to say that Omali Shetela was chief of police, uh, which is not true, I wouldn't take the job. Uh, and and uh, so, you know, we created an entirely, an incredibly important place. We held for the first time in this city, a citywide uh, black community convention uh, where people came out. And uh, when I say we, uh, I, as the uh, chair of the political action committee, I organized it so that the community could come out and lay out our own agenda uh, that we wanted to be able to hold uh, ourselves accountable to and uh, that would establish how we would relate to others. Uh, and uh, so that was like an important uh, milestone. And uh, all kinds of uh, other amazing events happened. And it led to a situation where for eight years there was not a, a police killing mm -hmm. of an African in the city of St. Petersburg, Florida. And that's when the African working class really had power. And we were clear in every articulation that we made uh, that we represent the African working class. That's who we were. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and bones about it. Everybody understood it. You know, we said that we don't want any of the money. And the only time we, we took money from the city, which was a mistake, uh, was when, they, because the middle class Negroes were complaining, they call themselves capitalists. They were complaining because the, the, every city in this country uh, gets the money uh, uh, from the federal government for community development. They call it community development block grant money. And it's, supposed, it's given to the cities based on poverty and things like that. And so the African community is the basis for them giving the money. The feds giving the money to the city, but the Africans never get any of the money. They use the money to uh, park and lot for the Hilton Hotel. They use uh, uh, the money uh, for, uh, uh, there was a, a white women's center, uh, uh, and, uh, but the Africans never could get access to that money. We were the only ones that had an, or, or an organization that was capable of uh, fighting them to, to make them respond to it. When I say capable, I don't even know if we, we probably was, were the largest organization, but the thing is that none of the others were going to fight. They were not going to resist, and the city and this always knew that. They didn't have to worry about Reverend Chickenbone doing anything but praying. Uh, and, 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 be, and he wouldn't even make a, 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 an angry prayer. So uh, uh, we had the, the muscle and uh, we had also the resources and we demanded uh, uh, that the city uh, provide uh, this community development block grant money for a project. We didn't need the money. We truly did not need the money. We had a building, we had a gym, and we said uh, we wanted to get this money to renovate the building and, and to get some gym equipment. And so we forced them to do that. And the reason we did it was because we wanted to set a precedent so that money could come to the African community. But what happened was uh, we forced them to give the money to us, and then they used a Negro on the city council to change the rules, to make it impossible or nearly impossible for Africans to get the money anymore because they said, now, if you want money, you have to have an amount of money equal to that which you are demanding for, black community, uh, for, the, uh, neighbor, for the community development block grant money. And so that kicked the Africans out again. And it was an African uh, city council person uh, that they used to do that kind of thing. So you have this whole neo-colonial puppet, cowardly uh, relationship. Uh, uh, some of them uh, uh, pretend, uh, you know, very close proximity to God and other things like that. And others uh, just, uh, you find it hard to separate their lips from the posterior of the white ruling class. But in some way, they, they were all... Uh, dependent, and they were all cowardly, they were spineless, and would not stand up for the people and what have you, and, and our movement did that. And the reason we were able to do it is because we have a revolutionary party. And our objective is to free our people uh, from this colonial domination. We're not fighting against racism. We don't care if the white people like us or not. That's your problem. That's their problem. It's not our problem. And so what we want is for our people to have some power. And uh, that's why we talk about uh, economic development. That's what we're talking about in the fusion of capital. That we're, 
uh, give the people a capacity to uh, achieve some kind of power in our own communities. That's, that's the direction that we were trying to drive things into. But you have sectors of the population who don't have any confidence in the ability of the people who, or who don't care for that kind of thing. For example, uh, 21 years later, we have the three John Black girls. And here you have the sheriff department murdering three children, three black children, my children, your children. They murdered them. And then uh, they say, well, they were car thieves. And so therefore we murdered them. Even if it were true that they were car thieves, when is it legitimate to say we're going to kill two 15-year-old and one 16-year-old girl, drown them to death because they stole a car? And of course, that, that was a lie. And, and, and that was uh, such a profound lie uh, that uh, it, it's not worth talking about this moment, but you will hear about it and have heard about it in the case of three drowned black girls. But what we've seen is sectors of the black middle class cowardly, the head of the NAACP, comes out and justified their murder. Another person who just ran for mayor, Negro, who just ran for mayor, came out and justified the murder of these three girls. And they're talking about you have to be uh, careful and be uh, about what kind of uh, issues that you take on. This was plain murder. And if those had been two, three Jewish uh, 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 girls who were killed, they wouldn't, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. But they're cowards and they betray our community, but they have influence in our community. There's no way we can deny that. And what we have to do, of course, is build our own base and recapture the kind of influence that we need. Uh, so our influence has to be among the masses of our people. I don't give a damn what kind of relationship that these cowards have with the mayor or, or somebody else like that. But as long as we have the best relationship with the African working class, we will prevail. And this case that started, uh, as you mentioned, 21 years ago, uh, what happened is the city uh, uh, got a so-called Hope Six grant. And the Hope Six grant was something that the federal government had refused to give them until after the rebellion. When the rebellion happened, they sent a, a, a request for a Hope Six program and it was hundreds of pages deep, and, in, and most of the pages had to do with pictures and things like that uh, from scenes of the rebellion. And the Hope Six was a uh, program of something that's supposed to uh, disperse the, the poverty in the community. And, and what it meant was to get spread African people out so that we don't constitute a political and economic uh, power uh, base or potential for that. And then they, the housing project, right off 22nd Street, it's half the size it was then because the Hope Six program went in there. And when they did that and put the people out, of course, what they did was they destroyed the economic base for the businesses, black businesses that were up on 22nd Street. And, and they created this so-called, uh, this other program that they call Weed and Seed. And Weed and Seed where they will come out and, and give a handful of Negroes uh, some money uh, if they will accept, uh, create some kind of program, but they have to accept uh, the all kinds of police organizations in the community. That could include the FBI, the ATF, the local state uh, cops and things like that, and agree that there would be enhanced sentencing for anything that uh, uh, someone is arrested for under these circumstances. And there are people who brag about the fact that they took Hope Six money, and guess what? The Hope Six grant itself was no more than three hundred and some thousand dollars which was less than the in annual income of the white man who was the mayor of the city at the time. This is the African petty bourgeoisie, the middle class that would do anything. And they call themselves being progressive because they come up with some kind of silly program that's supposed to teach reading or something like that. When they turn the African community over uh, to uh, the state in the most grotesque uh, kind of way. So, uh, and these are the same people that we're fighting today. These are the same people. One of them, as I said, uh, ran for mayor. Uh, uh, the NAACP has uh, united with the explanation given by the Sheriff Department for murdering these three black girls. They should never be forgiven, and this should never be forgotten, uh, the terms of the crimes that they commit against our community. But we have to build, well, we have to punish the police and the state for what they've done. We have to demand that the black community control the police because we have to move toward independence and capturing political power in our own hands over our own community. So uh, this is what part of what we need to understand about what happened 21 years ago on October 24th. I want to salute uh, Deanne Lewis the sister of Tyrone Lewis, uh, who uh, has been involved in trying to participate in the resistance uh, since the murder of her brother. I want to salute Pamela Lewis, uh, Tyrone Lewis's mother, uh, for uh, the stance that they took. And uh, I just want to say that uh, they failed because the objective of killing us in the fashion that they killed Tyrone Lewis is to terrify people, to frighten them so that you won't resist. 
and Deanne Lewis is standing up today saying that you failed, and Pamela Lewis is saying that you failed, and the entire family of Tyrone Lewis is standing today saying that you failed. And we named the gym for Tyrone Lewis because he's not just going to be a piece of dead meat. Like the, the, like the three girls, they want him to be just dead meat. He's not going to be dead meat like they want to be Mike Brown. They leave you laying on the, on the, uh, in, on the pavement, 100 degree plus weather, rotting for four and a half hours. It's not going to be meat. We're going to put up a street sign. Mm -hmm. We put it up there before the city's taking it down twice. We're going to put it back up again, naming that street for Tyrone Lewis in the very place where they murdered him, it shall be known as Tyrone Lewis in this community. So that's the significance of what happened then. It's the lie that they made any kind of improvement since that time. It's a, it's a bald-faced lie. Not only have they not made improvements, it's worse today than it was back then in, in, uh, in 1996 when they murdered Tyrone Lewis. Uhuru. Uhuru, Deanne. Uhuru, she wanted to call and salute you. Through. And everybody on the live, I don't know if you see this. Dan Lewis FaceTiming us right now. Tyron Lewis's sister, but so she just wanted to say hello to him. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> and she's also joining us on the live stream. Um, Dan, she's, I mean, she's an amazing, amazing sister. And she, um, but she, does, she doesn't like to say a lot, but I mean, every time she does, it's very powerful. But I really want to salute um, that presentation, Chairman Amalia Shatella. And um, I know over the course of this presentation, you saw a lot of hearts and things like that because a lot of people are saluting you uh, over this live stream right now. Um, but really, really appreciate you coming on to sum up the significance um, of the murder of Tyron Lewis and the rebellion of 1996 and all of the work that it is that we have to do and that you know this movement has to be responsible of you know getting back into the masses of the people and winning the masses to political life and um so i just i really want to appreciate may i mention one other thing yes mm -hmm. they uh, we talk about how the petty bourgeoisie that what terrifies the government most is this identification of the state mm -hmm. and the police as the state and the oppressive relationship that we have them with them as a colonized people I saw in the Tampa Bay Times today that professes to be a newspaper, mm -hmm. that uh, some kind of conference as is being happened by this entity that calls itself FAST, F-A-S-T. I've forgotten what it stands for, but I know there are so-called churches and other things associated with that. And this FAST group uh, has put forth that they're coming together and they are actually now fighting for, to deal with the interest in juvenile justice mm -hmm. or something to that effect, in juvenile crime. And so what they're going to do, they're proposing, especially in the face of all of the car fees in yeah. the black community, mm -hmm. they're proposing uh, now that to keep the uh, young people from getting criminal records, they're just going to start issuing citations on them first. Uh, and so they don't deal with the fact that it is the state, it's the ruling class that's the criminal, that they're starving our children and then flashing in front of them mm -hmm. pictures of, of uh, wealth that's been created by their parents and grandparents on a regular basis. And then they want to flash this and say uh, to the children, and you can't have it, but here it is. White people have it. And they all they got to do is go to Central Avenue, and they see nothing but luxury among white people, and they're going to starve this community. And then they're going to say the children are the criminals for wanting just what everybody else has. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a group of liberals. This is the group of our friends. These are the white people who love us, along with their Negro uh, minions who are pumping this garbage out that does nothing but contribute, contribute to the criminalization of our people. So on the one hand, they say what they're doing is they're really being nice because they're keeping the children out of the system. What they're doing is giving citations instead of whatever the hell else they would be giving them. I guess that means that what do you, you have the cops chase them into a pond to give them a citation now. I mean, this is the most ridiculous kind of thing. And, I, and, and nobody, everybody should be opposed to this behavior by these so-called liberals, these so-called white people who love us and the Negroes who hang out with them. Uh, that should be unacceptable, totally unacceptable. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you, Chairman Amara Shatello, for that brilliant presentation, for summing this up for everybody and the significance of, you know, October 24th, 1996, November 13th, 1996, and just the, the historic, um, just, you know, the historic understanding of the fact that this, this rebellion, this resistance, it should be 
a reminder that, you know, we have to continue forward. And I just think that everything that you have laid out is, you know, is, is the way forward because we said that the conditions 21 years ago have worsened for the African community, but um, that's not a sign of defeat on behalf of the African community. That's a sign that, you know, we have to work, you know, extremely hard and organize. And in this period where, you know, imperialism is obviously in crisis um, and it's lashing out against the African community every single day, you know, we really have to seize this moment, organize um, to overturn this colonial system. So thank you. Chairman Rajatella and everybody, please give one more salute to the chairman, and um, I really appreciate it. Okay. Well, what up? Well, all right. So for everybody who's watching and who's been, you know, listening to this profound presentation, and you know, you want to know how to get involved. Well, this is the part of you know learning how you can be a part of this process. So um, I'm calling on all of you. You guys heard the significance of the Just for the Three John Black Girls campaign and that, you know, you know, Chairman said we have to punish the state for their crimes. And this is what this campaign is engaged in doing. It's building and, you know, calling for resources to file the wrongful death suit against, you know, this the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department and, you know, even suing the Tampa Bay Times for the slanderous articles against the African community. You know, the whole made up lie about a star, a, a car theft epidemic is another attack on the African community for the attacks on, you know, Isaiah Battle, Dominique Battle, and Kunde Mombita and her entire family. You know, the Tampa Bay Times has to be sued for this type of, you know, defamation of African children in the African community. And, you know, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department has to be held accountable. They have to be indicted for the murders of these African children. Um, and they have to get out of the African community. The Pinellas County Sheriff's Department has to get out of the African community, and African people need black community control of the police um, as a way to seize independence over our own, independence over our own lives. And that gives us the ability to hire, fire, train, and discipline those who should function in our community as you know the police and protect African people from you know the colonial police that come in and occupy our community. You know, black community control of the police deconstructs that whole relationship. No one can come to the African community and inflict harm upon our community especially without um, any type of consequences. So there are several different ways that you can get involved with this campaign, but you know, first and foremost, you can donate. So um, this period now, I'm calling on all of you to visit Justice Number 4 of the Chairman. Oh, we're coming. Through. Donate, 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 donate. You heard him. That was a mandate from Chairman Amalia Shatella. <laughs> so um, I have my comrade Casey out in Boston. And she is going to be taking note of everybody um, who says they can donate. But I'm going to be looking out in the comments. But I'm asking for everybody um, to contribute to the Justice for the Three Drown Black Girls campaign. You can visit justice4dominiquebattle.com and make your donations there. We have a goal to raise $1,150. So, Casey, if you can put that in there because I kind of butchered that number. But um, we have a goal, and I know this goal is possible. Um, we, you know, our audience has peaked up to 60 at this point um, today, so I want to see who can donate today, who can be the first one to um, donate. Put your name in the comments and say how much you're willing to donate, and um, I want to give you guys a shout out. So come on, let's help reach this goal tonight. Who do we have? I'm going to try my best to navigate through this live comment feed. It's a little confusing. So Uhura, who's going to be our first donor tonight? Casey's going to be taking down all the names. Again, let me know. Uhuru, Deputy Chair. We also, um, again, appreciate Deanne Lewis, Uhuru Dia, um, Uhuru Kim, Uhuru Stephanie, Uhuru Aquan. All right, so go ahead. And Uhuru Kazuya, Uhuru Lisa, all this. Amazing. Who Dr. Aisha Fields, who Kabula. All right. Ooh, Kafira, Nicardo, who All right. I don't, um, if you guys are making donations or pledging donations, I don't see them as of yet. So I don't know if it's my feet over here or if nobody is, you know, got the courage or whatnot. But, okay, we have to reach this goal. Um, you know, we have to raise $1,150 tonight, and I know that we can do it. 
So please go ahead and say how much you are willing to donate tonight. Um, again, justice number four, dominiquebattle.com. The link is in the comments. Casey has provided the link for everybody um, to go ahead and make their donations. And <clears throat> I also want to say that you can get in, there are various ways to get involved in this campaign. Um, you can join this committee. You can contact us at justice number 3dbg at impedum.org. Casey, make sure you drop that link for everybody who wants to get in contact with this. You can also participate in our national call-ins to the Sheriff's Department, the Governor's Office, the Mayor's Office, and the Tampa Bay Times, um, which is a slanderous white nationalist excuse for a newspaper that attacked African children. And you can find out more about the calling campaign by following our social media pages. Make sure before you leave here tonight, you like this um, Facebook page and you follow our Instagram. We have a new Instagram account at 3DBG campaign. Um, it's at number 3DBG campaign. So Casey, if you could just Drop all those links in there for me. And um, make sure you guys give those things a follow so you guys can keep up with all of our events coming up. So um, I may be missing some donations. I'm, I'm really I'm not sure what I'm seeing currently. This thread is a little bit confusing. But um, Casey, if you could text me anything that's come in and I'm just not seeing it, um, I would really appreciate that. Uhuru. But I really want to appreciate everybody who just came onto this call. Um, I want to appreciate. Oh, oh, hold up, hold up. Um, oh, Deputy Chair Ona Zanae Shetela says she will donate a hundred dollars. Thank you, Comrade Deputy Chair Ona Zanae, and for all the hard work that you are accomplishing in St. Louis, it is so powerful. I am so just. I always get so overwhelmed just hearing about it. It's so beautiful. You guys haven't gone to St. Louis get to St. Louis and help out with this, these amazing economic development projects at the African Socialist Party. It's amazing. All right, we got 30 from Renee. Uhuru, Renee. Thank you, comrade. We have 80 from U.S. in Boston. Uhuru, Boston. Okay, okay, okay. I see Allison. Uhuru, donating $50. Uhuru, Allison. Thank you. Um, she says, adjust for the crimes against the African community. Reparations now. Right on. Um, we have $50 from Valerie, Uhuru Val, and uh, 50 from Walter Drummond, Uhuru Walter. Nice to meet you, Uhuru. All right, Uhuru Kitty, um, Uhuru Kitty, uh, also amazing work and amazing stance in solidarity with African people. And um, oh, I see that you're donating $50. Um, Uhuru Kile, just for the three girls, I'm donating $50 reparations now. Uhuru comrades, and thank you, Casey. For keeping me up to date. I don't know why I seem like a, um like I'm in inept in handling social media, but I promise I'm not. I'm young. <laughs> okay. Um all right, but yeah, go ahead and keep coming with the donations. I have just a couple of announcements. Um but before I go into that, I just want to say that we have a lot of work to do for this very important campaign, but we're definitely gonna need resources to make this thing happen. And um <clears throat> you know just the things that we want to do with this campaign we Recently, uh, Kunde Mwambita, um, in the beginning of this year, along with president of the International Democratic Uhuru Movement, Kalambai and Zanet, went on tour to talk about this campaign. It was the first 3DBG tour to, you know, talk about this campaign to win support, win um, support for justice for the three John Black girls. And it was amazing. And these are the kinds of things that we want them, this committee to be able to do, you know, every year. And um, we have a project coming in the works. Uh, Black people grand, Black people's grand jury, um, the three John Black girls edition. So we're definitely going to need resources to make that happen to indict these killer cops. So please, please, please donate again. Justice number four, DominiqueBattle.com, and um, you can also, you know, mail out checks. And you know, it's you can make out make it out to Justice for Dominique. Your checks are Justice for Dominique. That's it. There's no numbers. It's Justice word for Dominique. They got your checks and send them to the Uhuru House in St. Petersburg, Florida. And, um, you know, you can contribute that way as well. Um, same with any you know, cash donations or anything like that. But if it's easier, please visit justice number four, dominiquebattle.com, and make your donations. Help us reach this goal tonight. Um, and we're, you know, we're doing so amazing already. I really want to appreciate everybody who's donated so far. Um, and, oh, did I see another comment? Um, no, but I do see some more people joining. 
Uhuru Brian, Uhuru Zenobia, Uhuru, Uhuru. Um, thank you guys for coming on. All right, so so for a few announcements that we have um, before we close out, <clears throat> I want to, oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, are there any questions? I'm gonna be fielding questions. So did anybody have any questions um, that they wanted to uh, raise, ask, or anything like that um, before <clears throat> I go into announcements? I don't wanna miss anybody's important questions. So I'll give you time to, oh, we have, Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm missing, I'm missing uh, donations. Uhuru Kabula, $150. Uhuru Comrade. Uhuru, thank you to David Rolls for the $10 donation. Thank you, Comrade. Uhuru, I'm sorry, I miss you guys. Y'all don't know what it's looking like on my end. It looks kind of crazy. Sorry. Um, okay, okay. All right. But yeah, are there any questions? Um, again, it might just be a uh, delay in time for where I'm talking and when you guys are able to hear me. So I just wanna make sure if there are no questions, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. I think that the chairman's presentation was, you know, pretty profound and, you know, very kind of self-explanatory in, in a way that, I mean, there's nothing that he missed and it was just very on point. And, um, you know, again, we have to really internalize the significance of this event that happened in 1996 because it, is you know it's history it's groundbreaking so much happened and it sh and it still reverberates in the city today and it's still a testament to the fact that you know we have to win we have to win because you know again this whole the whole idea that 21 years later the conditions of african people have worsened you know this is a clear indication that we have to be with the masses we have to be with the people we have to win them into political life, win them to the stance of independence in our lifetime. And, you know, out of the clutches of the petty bourgeoisie who will sell out the interest every time of the African community. And we saw that in these electoral campaigns. We saw the filthiest of Cretans come out. We saw them attack Kunde Mavita. We saw them attack the African working class just to get them a job. And we're saying no more. We're taking the masses of people out of the clutches of their hands and we're bringing them to political life. And, you know, the same kind of resistance because that was the African working class. It wasn't the petty bourgeoisie who pushed back 300 forms of police out of this community and for, who protected the Uhuru movement, protected the chairman. That was the African working class. It wasn't a doctor, it wasn't a lawyer, or it, was a, it wasn't a preacher out there. It was members of the African working class coming out to defend this movement. And we have to be with those masses because they are still there. And the new generation, you know, is out there. We have to get the masses and bring them to political life, understanding the significance of this rebellion that happened in St. Petersburg, Florida, and how <clears throat> we have to continue the struggle. We have to continue to uphold the name Tyrone Lewis, because the chairman said, it's not just an African that they get to murder and sweep under the rug. It, is not get, it does not get to go down like that anymore. Dominique Battle, Anaya Miller, and Ashanti Butler are not Africans that you can just murder and sweep under the rug. It is our responsibility to hold up these names, hold up our martyrs, and to fight for them every single day, and to make sure that the white ruling class can't sleep, can't eat, without thinking about the, and looking and, and seeing the faces of the children they have murdered and know that the African community is coming for that ass, and that we will overturn this relationship, that the ruling class and the police will pay for the pain they've inflicted upon the African community. They have to pay a consequence, they have to pay a price, and we are a part of making that happen. So that's why your donations are very critical to this campaign. Again, justice number four at dominiquebattle.com. I'm going to be looking for questions really quick. And, um, oh, oh, oh. okay. Oh, Uhuru. We have $20 from Mira Uhuru. And um, we have $30 from Nick Uhuru, comrade Nick Uhuru. Talented, talented, beautiful dancer, Nick, out in Tia Uhuru. All right, I got that. All right, so, <clears throat> and you can even continue to donate after, you know, um, this web conference is over, please. Or, and, you know, if you feel like I donate today, hmm, I want to donate again today, I got a little more money today, you can always visit this website. It's going to be up and contribute to this campaign. I'm gonna go ahead and go into our announcements though um, and say that we have um, we have a couple of events coming up. And um, if you guys aren't in St. Petersburg, Florida, 
Um, you guys can live stream it from the St. Petersburg International People's Democratic Reform Movement page, but all of the institutions, a part of headquarters, are going to be responsible for conducting an event honoring, um, you know, Tyron Lewis and, you know, just really bringing this back to the forefront of the mass of the people. And so the next event is going to be a film showing of the Battle of St. Petersburg, which is an amazing documentary, which, you know, just lays out what it is the chairman was just talking about. Um, it was just amazing footage of that time period. And after that, it's going to be a, um, oh, <clears throat> one second. Um, but yeah, it's going to be on October 29th, this Sunday at 4 p.m. at 1245, 18th Avenue, South Sophia Crew House in St. Petersburg, Florida. And, um, you know, it's going to be a beautiful event. And Chairman Ali Chatel is going to be giving another presentation. So you're not going to want to miss it. You never want to miss an opportunity to hear Chairman speak. So that's this Sunday. Also, um, this Wednesday, as every Wednesday, is our national call-in. So again, make sure you are following our like page and our 3 dg Instagram page so you can get all the information you need to participate in the national call-in to the governor's office, the mayor's office, the sheriff's department, and the Tampa Bay Times. Constantly remind them that, you know, we are on their tails, that we will see justice um, for our girls and for all African children murdered at the hands of the police, um, that the fight is not over, that we are still on their heels. And um, also, October 31st is the... Um, the African People's Education Defense Fund is hosting, right here in St. Petersburg, Florida, our um, annual Halloween event. It's the 11th annual Halloween event, and the vice chair of that committee of the Halloween event is Kunde Mavita. So you guys are not going to want to miss it. It's an amazing free event for children. It starts from 5 to 8 p.m. in the lot of the Uhuru House. There's going to be an array of games from Double Dutch, musical chairs, a dance contest, um, <clears throat> and all these different you know, all these different amazing games. There's going to be exercise for candy. So if your kids want candy, you got to exercise for And then there's going to be also in a crew house. I mean, not a crew house. There's already a crew house. There's going to be a haunted Halloween house. And it, again, it's a free event. It's safe for African children. It's something that the African community has been putting on uh, for 11 years. Um, the, AP, the APEDF AP EDF has been putting on for 11 years. So you don't want to miss that. Come on out. Um, again, that's October 31st from 5 to 8 p.m. And... Um, our next webinar will be happening in November, and you'll be receiving information about that soon. And it's going to be talking about African and indigenous liberation and in honor of, you know, well, not in honor of, but because, you know, November is the month that, um, you know, so-called Thanksgiving, which is actually just a slaughter of indigenous people. And we're going to be having our next web conference um, surrounding, you know, the struggle for African liberation and how that's tied to, um, Indigenous liberation. So um, we have a couple of, so MPDOM NYC asked if someone from our committee would be interviewed for a talk show in New York, and we would love to um, take that on. I would ask that you please uh, message us the information. Please email us um, at justice3dbg um, at mpdom.org, giving us information of this talk show and everything like that, and we would love to arrange and work it out. And um, in, also, NPW NYC is doing $63, and, um, and Casey is going to donate two more to round it up, so that's going to be banking our total at $710. So uh, we are a little bit under our goal. Again, our goal is $1,150, <clears throat> and we have six minutes of the program um, is officially over. So... Let's get this uh, go up to at least a thousand comrades. Um, we're at seven ten now, so let's see who can um, make this happen. Let's get us on up there. Get us up to a thousand at least, comrades. Let's make it happen. Let's make the work happen. Let's go. I see a lot of hearts. I want those hearts to transition to coin. Okay. Who <laughs> comrades? Who Tanya? Uhuru Twanya and Uhuru Ann, Uhuru Comrades. All right, again, we're at 710. Um, if you prefer to donate anon anonymously, you can also do that. If you don't want to be shouted out, that's fine. Again, make sure you visit justice4dominiquebattle.com and make your donation today. 
Um, we really appreciate any and every donation. Um, really salute all those who have donated and just salute all of you for being on this web conference today. Um, um, Mara, oh, okay. So Mara, um, who is an attendee at the Boston DSAP. Oh, Mara, I remember, Kuru. Um, she just did 25, so we are currently at 7.30. So come on, let's get up to 1,000. Get on up. Get on up to 1,000. All right. Let's do it. We can do it, y'all. We can do it. Come on, we got 34 people on this, on this live right now. We rocking with. All y'all donate 25, like not 25 hours, I mean five hours. You know, we can make something happen with that. We can make that stretch. We can make that stretch. So, but again, anonymous donations, we take that to justice number four, dominicbattle.com. Let's make that happen. Let's make that happen. Come on. All right. All right, y'all. So I'm assuming that the rest of y'all are donating anonymously. You don't want to let us know. Or have some cash and check donations. So I'll let that slide. Um, y'all got four more minutes to donate. But again, just want to really, really, really express my appreciation. Um, yes, KC, people do make out checks to Justice for Dominique written in that or written in that order. Justice word for Dominique. <clears throat> The word for, not number four, the word for. The only number four is in the website. So don't get that confused. All right. Okay. You guys are a good crowd though. So make sure you guys, you know, come up next next in November. And I think that it's actually November, um, it's the third Tuesday of November. So make sure you guys get out to that. Um, again, African Indigenous Liberation. And keep following these um, you know, monthly webinars. It's gonna be very, very important um, to just build support for the 3DBG campaign. Um, oh, we got 10 more from Susan. Who's Susan? Um, but yeah, it's gonna be just very important to, you know, just again, raise awareness about this campaign and to bring in, invite people who aren't on this now that you know need to hear this message about the Three John Black Girls campaign, who know nothing about this campaign at all, you know, tell them to come onto this, this next web conference that we're going to be having. Um, tell them to, you know, follow these pages and learn about these amazing campaigns and just how significant they are and, um, you know, help to just, you know, bring awareness to what it is that we're trying to do. Um, bring, bring more people onto this. And it's something, you know, very easy that people can participate in because you can do it, watch it from your phone, watch it from your computer. It doesn't take much. Just you know, log on, view this, and see some amazing presentations, see amazing political education, and um, you know, just learn more about this campaign and figure out how you can get involved. And you know, Chairman laid out, you know, the struggle that it is that we are involved in, and this is just one way that you can be involved in overturning this relationship that you know Chairman has laid out that that exists, that the whole social system rests on the backs of African people. And that as a result of this, you know, colonial system, as a result of imperialism and parasitic capitalism, you know, we will continue to experience the death of African children and African people. And, you know, not just by the police, but through gentrification, through homelessness, through poverty, through, you know, all these different types of ways that you can attack African people. You know, this will not be the existence of African people for much longer. And by donating to this campaign and ensuring victory in this campaign, you know, it's forwarding a part of the struggle uh, towards African liberation. So, you know, placing donations in Justice for Dominique is placing bullets into the gun that's going to bring down imperialism. So, you know, make sure you guys are part of this process, taking down this social system and winning justice for these three girls, winning justice for Kunde Mwambita and all African mothers um, who should no longer have to deal with this kind of tragedy and just slaying this dragon, slaying this beast the slander against the African community, this fake um, car theft epidemic, all of these things. Let's slay this dragon once and for all, and um, let's win total justice for African people with freedom for African people, freedom in our lifetime. 
All right, y'all, it's 8.30. I don't want to keep y'all over the time. Really, really appreciate all of you guys for participating, being part of this. Salute to Chairman Marge Tell us salute to Deanne Lewis and long live Taron Lewis, Dominique Battle, Lanai Mill, and Ashanti Butler. Justice for the three drowned black girls. Justice for Taron Lewis. Uhuru, and see you all in November. Uhuru, and keep donating. JusticeForDominicBattle.com. Uhuru, comrades. Mm-hmm.